are um, very fortunate to have uh, Professor Arthur McEwen here today to talk about a uh, very important <coughs> problem in this country, which unfortunately seems to be getting worse. You know, as we know, at a time when the government is shut down and when um, the government, uh, which is one way of at least trying to deal with this problem, <coughs> has its budgets increasingly cut, we have a serious problem. And we're fortunate to have Professor McEwen here to help us understand. Uh, professor McEwen is a professor emeritus of economics from the University of Massachusetts, Boston, where he taught for many years. <coughs> He's uh, currently the senior fellow at the Center for Social Policy at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. He has written considerably um, about this question. He has a number of books that he's written. One of his uh, co-author, uh, Economic Collapse, Economic Change, Getting to the Root of the Crisis. He's written many articles, again, dealing with poverty and social and economic inequality. So we're very lucky to have him. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's nice to be down here on a nice day. I want to uh, start by talking about an issue that's in the news, that is uh, health care issues. Um, that uh, this seems to be a factor related to the shutdown of the government right now. And what I want to note is that a few years ago, there was an unusual study undertaken in Baltimore. And what they did was they collected data on life expectancy by neighborhood. And in the neighborhood of Roland Park, which is a very upscale neighborhood in Baltimore, the average life expectancy was, and was, still is, this was a very few years ago, uh, 83, which is a good deal higher than the national average, uh, but in that realm. When they looked at the neighborhood of Holland's Market, which is in a very poor part of the city, they found that the life expectancy was 63. That's a spread of 20 years. Now, there's no reason to think that the situation in Baltimore is dramatically different than the situation in many other cities in our country, except that they did the study in Baltimore. However, we also have national data. And a report that came out shortly after that from in 2008 from the Congressional Budget Office uh, summarized its findings as followed. It said, in a continuation of a long-term trend, life expectancy has been steadily increasing in the United States for the past several decades. However, accompanying the recent increases, however, is a growing disparity in life expectancy between individuals with high and low income and between those with more and less education. The difference in life expectancy across socioeconomic groups is significantly larger now than in the 1980s or 1990s. Now, the reason, the reason I start with that is to emphasize that poverty and inequality are not just matters of income. They affect and are associated with a wide variety of aspects of our lives. Health care is perhaps the starkest issue. And when you see that kind of life expectancy difference, is the, the, as was the case in Baltimore, you begin to see uh, what's going on uh, and how it affects your lives. Poverty, whatever else it means, means that you die earlier. Now, what I want to do this morning I want to tell you the main points that I want to make in case things, in case you, you doze off or whatever. I, I, let, let me get the main point, the central points down now. First of all, we have a high degree of inequality 
in the United States in terms of income distribution and wealth. It has been increasing for a number of years, and it has wide effects, as the health example shows. However, this has not always been the case. Things have changed a great deal in the last 50 years. The changes have been largely brought about by political decisions. And the final point is because they've been brought about by political decisions, they can be changed by political decisions. To be sure, there are other factors involved. It's not simply political, and I'll come back to that. But instead of looking at the situation and saying, well, you know, that's hopeless, the poor are always with us, uh, and those kinds of things, if we recognize that the increasing inequality was brought about in large part by political decisions, then we can see that it's possible to change things in, towards a more equal society uh, by political action. So that's where I want to go. Now, in talking about poverty, uh, let me clarify what we mean. I, the poverty lines in the United States that are developed by the federal government and apply across the country, and I'll come back to that in just a moment, are defined this year by these figures up on the screen. That is, if you're a family of four and you have an income below 23550 you are considered in poverty. And those are the numbers up there for different sized families. Now, it is widely recognized that there are a lot of problems with these numbers. First of all, they apply across the country. Uh, they, the same figures are used for, say, Boston, New York, and San Francisco on the one hand, some of the most expensive places to live in the country, and small Midwestern towns where it's much less, more expensive, or, excuse me, much less expensive. Uh, for example, uh, my mother lives in Tucson, Arizona, and whenever I go out there, I am struck by things being cheaper. Uh, and the ho housing prices there are much lower than they are around here. So 23,000 may be an accurate figure for a family of four in terms of what we consider meeting basic needs in Arizona, in Tucson, in Boston, San Francisco, New York. Good luck. Uh, you'd have to, even, to be, you'd be in poverty with a good deal more. Nonetheless, they're a rough figure. Uh, they also have a problem in that uh, when this was first an issue, a public issue around 1960, uh, they sort of made up an ad hoc way of doing it. Namely, they took the food um, budget uh, that would be needed for a family of four, and then they multiplied it by three. Uh, to get a total income which would put people in poverty. They said, okay, if you need $10,000 for a family of four to survive with the food, then we'll call it poverty if their total income is below $30,000. And that system has been maintained, even though there are all sorts of changes in our lives in the last 50 years that make that problematic. I, Nonetheless, because it's used for a number of federal programs, you can understand why it has been maintained. It's very hard uh, to, change, uh, to change politically. Now, if we look at the situation according to those figures, what we find is that since the early 1960s, the three highest rates of people in poverty across the nation have been about the same at the 15.1 uh, or in 1983, 15.3 uh, as they are now. I, now, one of the things that's important to recognize about this is those three times were all, are all times right after a serious recession. That is, the poverty 
rate is attached to the condition of the economy, not to the behavior of individuals, but uh, not by people deciding they want to take it easy or something like that. Poverty goes up when the economy goes down. Not very surprising, uh, but sometimes not recognized. Now, there are some other figures on this table up here to which I want to bring your attention. One is that the situation for children is more severe. That is to say, the poverty rate for children is much higher on average. That is, you see, it's almost today. It's well, 2011 is the most recent data I was able to find easily. It was almost 22 percent. There's no reason to think it's gone down in the last year or so. Massachusetts, it turns out, is appears to be much better off. That is the uh, 2011 rate, and the total rate in 2011 was just about the same as it is now. The total rate was a little less than 12 percent, as you can see up there. Now again. To go back to what I said earlier, that's misleading because this is a national poverty rate. The cost of living in Massachusetts is generally higher than the average. Therefore, people that appear to be out of poverty in Massachusetts uh, are really what we would view as in conditions of poverty. So that figure uh, is, is misleadingly low. The all-time low uh, on record is 1973, just before the recession of that year, or that developed, started to develop in that year. Now, one of the really interesting and uh, important stories in what's happened to people in poverty is contained in those next three lines. That is, poverty among the elderly, people over, uh, over uh, 65. In 1959, 35 percent of the elderly were in poverty. By the 1974, 14%, and today, less than 9%. Now, that's not because people get rich when they get old. What it's because of is the advances that were made with Social Security. The combination of more and more people being covered by Social Security, and secondly, by indexing, that is, connecting in, uh, Social Security payments to inflation, those factors greatly reduced the, uh, the poverty rate among the elderly and also Medicare, uh, which affected the lives of the elderly, was very important in this period. In other words, in terms of improving living conditions for the aged, those federal programs have been extremely successful. You may ask yourself why such successful programs are under attack in Washington uh, now and in recent years, and we, we can come back to that. But it's important to recognize uh, that the success with those programs has been the reality. Now, poverty cannot be understood simply as an absolute phenomenon, that is to say, below a certain amount of money. Poverty is defined in our own eyes in relation to other people. Poverty is not a relationship between people and things, that is, the commodities we buy. Poverty is a relationship among people. We consider ourselves poor or rich or in the middle compared to what other people have. So to understand the impact on people's lives, we have to look at income distribution uh, as well. Now, what we see when we look at income distribution, and these are figures from right before the onset of the Great Recession of a few years ago. In 2007, the top 1%, the 1% getting the highest incomes, were receiving 25 percent of all income, whereas the rest, the 99 percent, were receiving 75 percent. This was roughly the same as it was just before the onset of the Great Depression. Excuse me, I, I, we skipped some. 
Uh, yes, there we go. That's the onset of the Great Depression in 1928. Uh, the figures in both cases weren't exactly the same, a little less than 25% in both years. Now, the point that I stated earlier is shown by the next slide, namely that it hasn't always been this way. In the 50s, 60s, and early 70s, the w people at the top were doing quite well. Uh, they were getting plenty. They were getting a 10%. That 1% was getting 10%, but the rest were getting 90%. A very different situation in terms of the distribution of income. This is illustrated by what was happening to the relation between the pay of the top executives in the top uh, in the major corporations, about 25 per times the pay of the average worker. Today, in the early uh, in the early 2000s, it had risen to 250 times the pay of the average worker. Now, I like to look at things, however, not just in terms. I like the pictures. I, just to make, I go back to that picture for a moment, I, the person who helped me with these slides and find some appropriate pictures in choosing their corporate executive I, did not realize at the time how much he was going to be in the news. This is Jamie Dimon, who is the chief executive officer of the, um, the, Chase, the JP Morgan Chase, which is the biggest bank in the country. He's been in the news a lot recently because an issue which I'll come back to, uh, he is one of the big defenders of the deregulation of banks. Um, this was quite an issue last year when it turned out through the, de <coughs> excuse me, the deregulation, his bank uh, made a $6 billion error, uh, lost $6 billion, uh, which could have led to far-reaching repercussions. I mean, for most of us, $6 billion is a pretty big repercussion in itself. Uh, but, but it could have been much bigger. But he didn't change his positions. He still needed the deregulation, an issue uh, I'll come back to. Now, as I, as I said, I like these pictures. I, this one I, I find particularly effective in, uh, in clearing up what's been happening. However, I like to look at graphs as well. Now, what this graph shows is what's happened to the share of income received by the highest income 1% over the period of almost 100 years for which we have data. And what you see is in the 1920s, leading up to the Great Depression, the, the share of this group went up and up, reaching the figure that I referred to earlier of almost, almost 25%. With the Depression, the war, and all the changes that were made, many of them political changes, political changes, which I'll come back to, the share of this group at the top dropped down. So <clears throat> in the 50s and 60s, it was hovering around 10%. Starting around 1980, it started going back up and by the time of the Great Recession of a few years ago, it was back up in the neighborhood of where it had been in the late 1920s. I, we have this extreme degree of inequality that has been building over the last several decades. Now, the question then comes up, of course, well, these data just take us up to a few years ago before the Great Recession, What's happened in the last few years? And some material has just been developed that I've put up on this table for you. Now, you may be interested in the first line here because it tells you roughly what's happened in most of your lifetimes. That is, you were, most of you, I assume, were born somewhere around 1990. Uh, some of you weren't, to be sure. Uh, but this shows us what's happened. Now, in this period, since 1993 to, to 2012, average incomes in the country have gone up by 17.9%. That's the first figure. Average incomes of the top 1% went up 
by 86%. Average incomes of the 99% went up by 6.6%. What that means of, is that of all the income increases that took place in this 20-year period, two-thirds, or 68%, went to the top 1% of the population. Now, in the Great Recession itself, interestingly, the top group lost more than at a higher rate than the rest of us. They accounted for 49%, roughly half the loss. Uh, and you can see that they, they, theirs declined by 36%, while the 99% only lost at 12%. I, I couldn't, however, get up a lot of sympathy for Warren Buffett, uh, who went from having a net worth of, I don't know, $50 billion down to $30 billion. Uh, uh, but the thing is that one of the things that happens in a recession is that, that profits decline very sharply. Uh, and that accounts for what happened to people who were in that top 1%. Whereas what happens for most of the rest of us is that a lot of people lose their jobs. But for the people who keep their jobs, which after all, even though unemployment is serious, most people kept their jobs, their incomes don't decline a whole lot. So in the short run of a recession, the percentage loss of people at the top is greater. But don't get upset for them. Uh, because when you look at the next line, you see what's happened in the, le in the three years coming out of the recession. In that period, 95% of the gains went to the top 1%. 95% of the gains went to the top 1%. Their incomes increased by 31%, whereas the 99%, less than 1%. 4% rise in incomes. Uh, if you wanted to look at the top 10%, the top 10% hit a new record in 19 in 2012, the top 10% obtained more than 50% of all income. In no year for which we have data has that been true before. So this gives you these, these pictures and graphs and, and tables I give you various, various pictures of what's happened to the distribution of income in the United States over whether you want to take the last 50 years or your own lifetimes or the last very short period since, uh, since the recession. Now, this leads, all this, these data lead to two questions. First question is, why is this a problem? Why is this a problem? And the second question is, why has this happened? Now, many of you may think, well, isn't it obvious why it's a problem? But you must understand that a lot of people think it isn't a problem. A lot of very influential people. Uh, what they will say is what matters is the absolute amount of income that people have, not what other people have. And we are still, on average, a very rich country by comparison with other countries. Now, there, there are problems with that. And it goes back to what I said earlier. That is, not, we judge our own position, not simply in terms of what we have, but in relation to what we think we need. And our concept of our need comes from the society around us. We judge where we are by what we see as our needs that are socially developed. I'm, for example, when I was your age, I did not need a cell phone. Cell phones were unheard of. I, Indeed, when I was your age, I didn't need a television, color television. We needed a black and white. 
uh, and, and so on. I mean, those are just stark examples. Uh, our, our housing needs were less. Lots of things were less because the society around us had less. In other words, as income rises, we get more things, we develop new needs. We develop different expectations of what we want. And this is not simply a psychological phenomenon. I mean, if, if I were to take away your cell phones from you, you if we could snap my fingers and make them disappear, you wouldn't say, well, I think I'll go to my psychiatrist and talk about this and that'll solve my problem. It's not simply a psychological phenomenon because our whole society gets structured in ways that require us to have things. We need, for example, we need our cars to get to work. As our society develops new forms of work requiring us to be mobile, we need our cars. The, and the, the, we could go on with the examples. As uh, another one I think that's important, as more women have entered the workforce over the last 50 years, our need for obtaining our food, other than by having the woman in the family cook it, has greatly changed. And this costs. So, it's important to look at where we are in relation to society. That's one of the reasons it's a problem if we simply look at absolute income. We have to look at our situation within the society. But it goes further than that. There's also a question of fairness. That people at the bottom, in my observation, work very hard. There are a few jobs at the bottom that I would take gladly because they are less strenuous. Every time I walk into a restaurant kitchen these days, I would, you have to, use, you need to get to the restroom sometimes, you see how hard the dishwashers are working in a hot, unpleasant conditions. And you say, well, what are these people getting paid? And they're probably getting paid the minimum wage. And I'll come back to the minimum wage a little later on. They are not working 1 250th as hard as the people at the top. And even if we said that people at the top somehow deserved their pay, why did they only deserve 25 times as much when the economy was doing very well in the 1950s and 60s? Remember, that's an important part of the story because sometimes we'll be told that you have to pay these people at the top well to get them to do their job. And what is their job, we're told? They are job creators. They're creating good things for all the rest of us. But in the 1950s and 1960s, unemployment was lower, incomes were rising better, yet these people at the top we're only getting paid 25 times as much as the average worker. And today, it's more like 250 times. So there's, when, when inequality is extreme, it strikes us as unfair. Another problem with it is that while some people claim that, yes, yes, the inequality is there, but we are a highly mobile society. That is, people move up, people move down, even if you start out poor, your chances of making it are, you know, are good. Simply not so. Simply not so. Number one, over these last decades where inequality has getting, been getting greater, the chances of people moving up from the bottom have been declining each decade, less and less. Not only that, but we compare ourselves with those Countries in Europe with a similar level, their mobility is greater. People at the bottom in those societies have a better chance of moving up, and they are less unequal than our society. The reasons are simple enough. Uh, people with money, one of the things they use their money for is to preserve their position. Now, there's some quite reasonable ways of doing that, 
That is, they spend a lot on their children's welfare. And nothing, I mean, once they have the money, there's none of us are going to object to their using it in that way. You might even say, well, you know, these people are, are quite reasonable. They take care of their kids well. The problem is they use it in a lot of other ways, too. I, as the Supreme Court is hearing a case about today about the limits on uh, donations to political campaigns. Uh, and of course, what's going on here is the rich can influence our political lives by their money uh, in a number of ways. I mean, I'm all, I'm all for limiting the amount of money, donations that can be made, but that's just the beginning of the story in terms of uh, the way wealth affects power in our society. The, it, ha it happens through uh, the lobbying activities aside from the expenditures on elections. Uh, it happens because we tend to believe that uh, they are job creators, uh, so we give tax breaks to the wealthy, so supposedly they will create more jobs. Now, what's the company? There's a big company in Massachusetts that uh, had gotten a big tax break and last week or two weeks ago announced that it was leaving the state uh, uh, and somehow they weren't planning to give back the tax breaks that they got in for, for creating jobs. These are just illustrations uh, of, of the problem. So there's this connection between wealth and power, which is a very detrimental factor in our lives and it undermines democracy. Democracy does not mean one dollar, one vote. Democracy means one person, one vote. But we have moved more and more towards a society where one dollar is the basis for your power in society or your number of, of dollars. So another reason it's bad is because we value democracy and this extreme inequality undermines democracy. It's bad also for economic stability. It is not a random coincidence that the distribution of income in 1928 and in 2007 were at their highest peaks in the periods just before severe economic downturn. This is connected to a lot of factors connected to the weakness of the demand, that is the inability of people who are at the bottom to continue to buy things at the rate they have been buying things. Uh, this problem was held off in the early 2000s by the taking on more and more debt and by a, the system of banking regulation that allowed people who would never be able to pay it back to take on more and more debt. This was not a result of people being silly about what they were doing. It was a condition where the banks were virtually pushing money door to door in the same way that salesmen might go door to door. Now, you just if I may digress for a little, just a moment, I, you, you say, well, why, why would banks make loans to people who weren't going to pay them back? That seems a silly thing to do, right? Well, what they did was they loaned the money. That creates a mortgage. Then they took the mortgages and they bundled them into, I mean, I don't, you can think of it as they put them all in an envelope, but of course it was all electronic. And they bundled them, sometimes there were a thousand mortgages together. And this was called a collateralized debt obligation. Then these, these packages were sold to investors. And the investors would then get the stream of payments on those mortgages. So when you paid a, your monthly mortgage on your house, it didn't go to the bank that made the mortgage or the mortgage company that made the loan. It went to the investor who had bought the mortgage as part of this package. Now, one of the reasons people were willing to buy these packages is that they figured that 
there were all these mortgages in them, so this was diversification of their investment. You, you know, we all know the expression, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Well, that means you get a lot of different things. And sure, there might be problems with this mortgage or that mortgage, but the package as a whole will be good. That was not true. They were mistaken. Now, why did they make this mistake? You think of investors as often savvy people. Well, they're not. Uh, many investors are not so savvy. But perhaps more important is that there are what we call rating agencies. There are companies set up, there are three big ones, Standard & Poor's, Moody's, and uh, Fitch, that rate a bond or a mortgage. They'll rate it as AAA, meaning it's really good, or you've heard the expression junk, which means don't, uh, don't go near that one. Uh, they were rating these as AA, AAA. Who was paying them to rate these bonds? If you read a restaurant critic saying, the food in this restaurant is really good, and then you found out that the restaurant was paying the food critic, would you feel confident? Well, the rating agencies were being paid by the banks that were selling these collateralized debt obligations. Now, they claim this didn't affect our views at all. You can judge that for yourself. But in any case, uh, things, to go back to where I was, things were kept going for a while by this taking on of more and more debt. This was the housing bubble that we hear so much about. It couldn't last, and it didn't. Uh, so this also got us into these problems. And again, it goes back to both the great inequality uh, that was involved. I could go on. There's a lot of evidence that environmental conditions are hurt by inequality. We know also that there's a lot of evidence that crime is affected by inequality. I, <clears throat> now, interestingly, I always just assumed that sure, you know, when you have great inequality, people steal more, people at the bottom. Uh, it's les miserables, the, you know, you steal the bread to feed your children. It's not what happens, in fact. Uh, what happens is more crime against people, violent crime. Uh, the theories that explain this say what happens when you, have, uh, when you have great inequality is that social solidarity breaks down. And people are much readier to commit violent acts uh, that appear to make no sense uh, that goes on. And of course, in addition to all these other factors, there's the one I started with, health. And it's not just the health of the people at the bottom. It turns out that inequality affects the health of everybody all the way up. Now, why is that? When I, when I first encountered those data, the, the, the studies that showed it, I said, well, this is probably because when you have great inequality, we don't pay for good public health because the people at the top don't want to be taxed to pay for good public health programs. That's not what it's all about. What it's all about is stress. That inequality creates a great deal of stress because sort of no matter where you are, you're worried about sliding back down because there's so far to fall and you're worried about trying to keep up with the people ahead of you. And these great inequalities exacerbate that kind of stress. And there's a lot of evidence for this. It's not universally accepted, but it's pretty well established. First of all, it is well established that stress is bad for your health. But what's, what is pretty clear, but perhaps not quite as well established, is that inequality brings about a good deal of stress on people. So there are all these factors that help us understand why inequality in terms of income is a marker for a set of very serious social problems. So why has inequality grown so much in the last several decades? Now, <clears throat> to a large extent, as I suggest, excuse me, to a large extent, as I said, this can be explained by political decisions. One of the, the things to look at in what's happened, and to both explain the inequality uh, as well as to illustrate it again, 
If you look at what was happening to wages, these are wages, real wages, that is wages adjusted for buying power or inflation, between 1947 and the early 1970s, wages, average wages in our country rose roughly along the same path as did output per person, that is productivity. The gains from productivity as the economy grew turned out to be shared by people who were working and people who were running the economy. Oops. Uh, that in the early 1970s, this changed. Average wages in the United States have not gone up since the early 1970s in terms of their buying power. Now, how is this possible when we know average incomes have gone up? And the answer is partly that more people are working. The answer is people are working longer hours. Uh, those are two parts uh, of the answers, and co we come back to that further if you want. But when you look at the gap between the red line here and the blue line, you start to understand why the people at the top are getting so much more than they got before. This was an issue of political power. They were able to make decisions to hold down wages, to resist the demands of workers, to resist the demands of unions in successful ways, and keep down wages in this period. Now I'm going I'm to come back to a little more about why that was true. But one of the first things to recognize is that we had this severe wage stagnation. We could record what was going on in terms of power relations by other factors. For example, what's happened to pensions. That in the beginning of this period, that is in the early 70s, most people who had pensions had what are called defined benefit pensions. That is, you put in, your employer put in, and you got a defined amount of money when you retired. It was the employer's responsibility to make sure that was there. The employer bore the risk. Today, the vast majority of people who have pensions, and many don't from their work, many don't from their work, they have what are called uh, um, required, comp uh, I'm blocking on the word. You have to give in a certain amount of money. But what you get depends on what happens to the market. And so when the market crashed, in the Great Recession a few years ago, people lost their retirement funds to a huge extent. Now, they gained some of it back, but uh, it's a question they shift the risk. Employers tend not to give health insurance as often, and they don't give sick leave as often. These have all changed along with the stagnant, the stagnant wages. Now, one of the factors behind this, one of the factors behind this has been what's happened to the minimum wage. If we look at the minimum wage, it is, this again is in terms of buying power, but this is buying power in, in 2010 dollars. It went up from the 1940s, along with the improvement in the economy, until 19, the 1970s, when it peaked at about nine dollars an hour in current terms, in current buying power. Now, think about it for a minute, and when, when those wage and productivity graphs changed. When was that? Early 1970s, right? In other words, when you raise the floor, when you raise the floor, you raise wages generally. It doesn't just affect the people at the bottom. You might say, well, you know, what do I care about the minimum wage? I mean, I may care about somebody else, but I'm not affected. I'm earning $12, $13 an hour. Well, when that minimum wage goes up, it affects those $12 and $13 an hour wages too. It pushes people up. The gaps between people are maintained, and there's a gain throughout. Uh, <clears throat> so it, it is a widely impacting change when the wage at the bottom goes up or down. Since 1970, the buying power of the minimum wage went continually down and down, jumped up a little bit in the late 90s, down again in the early 2000s, and then up again to where it is now at nationally 725. 
States have their own minimum wage laws. In Massachusetts, we have a minimum wage of eight dollars an hour, if I, if I have that correct. Uh, and there is, which I'll come back to in just a moment, a major campaign underway to raise the minimum wage in Massachusetts. Uh, there's also a campaign which, at least for now, is dead in the water in Washington to raise the national minimum wage. But there's some real hope of getting the minimum wage raised in Massachusetts, which would affect things here. Incidentally, uh, that the, this decline in the minimum wage is worse than it looks. And you can see that if you think about Massachusetts for a minute. It looks like we have a high minimum wage. If you compare us with other states, for example, we have, we have, you know, they're, they're stuck at $7.25 as their minimum wage if they don't have a one uh, uh, at the state level that is higher than the federal one, whereas we have $8. It's about a 10% difference. It's not trivial. But we have higher cost of living and a higher average income. If you compare the minimum wage in Massachusetts with the average wage in Massachusetts, Massachusetts falls way down near the bottom. Some of those states, like Mississippi, with a low minimum wage, move up a great deal because within the context of their state, it's much better. So if you compared on this graph here, not just the buying power, but relative to the average income, the decline since 1970 would be, would be even greater. Now, while the minimum wage is important, it's connected to an element of political power. Now, remember that graph I showed you earlier that traced what happened to the income of the 1% over the last hundred years. This is the, the blue line here is the same line in that other graph. Okay? The green line is the percent of the workforce that is unionized in those years. Now look at those graphs for a moment, look at those lines for a moment. What you see is when the percentage of the population that was in unions was low, the 1% was getting a bigger share. Income distribution was more unequal. When unions grew in terms quantitatively and, of course, became more powerful, income equality got much greater. That's the period where the blue line is low and the green line is high. Since the late 1970s, union membership has gone down and down and down, and inequality has gone up and up and up. Now, that relation is complicated. It's not you know, a simple causation, but it's, it is suggestive of the power relationships behind what happened. Now, you say, well, maybe people didn't want to join unions. What's, what's the big deal? Well, it's not quite that simple. Well, it's a, the, I, I forgot, I've got this one here. This shows you the difference between being in a union and not being in a union in 2010, uh, it amounted to about $10,000 a year uh, difference when you compare, figure out the, the weekly wage difference. But, but what account, what's going on here? Well, one of the things that's going on is that this shows the probability of a, a union organizer or a person working in, a, in, a, in an office or in a factory or wherever uh, being fired in the process of a union organizing drive. And you can see back in the 60s and 50s, it was very low. Now, it's illegal to fire somebody. It's illegal to fire somebody for their engagement in, un in union organizing. You know, the boss can't say, well, I don't want a union here, so I'm going to fire you for trying to do that. That's illegal. But it wasn't being enforced. That's the politics behind what happened. It's not the whole story. There are more complicated issues I'll mention in a moment. But in the 1980s, in the 1980s, that went up to almost a third. If you got engaged as a leader in organizing a union drive, your probability of being fired was roughly a third. Now, that makes a difference. In other words, the National Labor Relations Board, as the slide said, wasn't doing its job. Well, you might think it was doing its job. Its job was to prevent unions because the people being appointed to the National Labor Relations Board didn't want, were anti-union people and were not enforcing the law. It's a little bit like having you know, cops on the block 
that think it's a neat thing to have, have people rob jewelry stores. Uh, that you would expect under those circumstances there might be a lot of robberies. Uh, well, here we have a, 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 similar, a similar kind of uh, phenomenon going on. Now, it's, it, so these are some important political things. I single out what happened to the minimum wage and the union membership as two factors that were crucial in affecting the distribution of income and how it increased in terms of inequality over the last few decades. Uh, there are more. But there's another side of this too. And that is not just were people at the bottom being held in their position, but people at the top were being given things politically that put them better. Think of the things we hear. The subsidies to the oil companies. The biggest and most profitable companies in the country are getting subsidies, money from the government. You don't pay enough at the gas station. You don't pay enough for your heating oil. The government has to give them money as well. Perhaps the most important example affecting our lives in recent years was what's happened to the financial sector, the banks, the man I showed you earlier. They have had the rules taken away. Now, with rules taken away, that's very advantageous to them, but it hurts the rest of us. Now, you can say, well, wait a minute, if the rules are taken away, uh, if I'm driving a car and we take down all the stoplights and the speed limits and other rules, that might lead to a lot of accidents. Well, this isn't quite the same because the people that are driving these cars, the people in the banks, know, the big banks especially, know that if they have an accident, the government will come along and bail them out because they are so important to the operation of the whole economy. Not because the government is doing something evil to pay these people off, but they have, you know, they, they've got us because if they fail, then we're all in trouble. Now, what this means is not only can they do things which yield large profits, but they can borrow money to do their actions at a lower rate because people say, look, I, I can give my money to J.P. Morgan Chase to hold for me because if something goes wrong, the government will bail them out. So I will not insist that they pay me as much as other things I can do with, with my money. Now, incidentally, while I said it's necessary to keep the banks from failing, you didn't have to do it that way. There were ways to bail out the banks without bailing out the bankers. Uh, that, the, that, that was the real issue. Uh, that you could keep the banks functioning but not allow the people that owned them and ran them to continue to make the money off them. This has been done with smaller banks. It has been done with some big banks. Uh, but it wasn't done in 2008 when the ba banks were bailed out here. Okay, I'm, let, me, let me try to bring things uh, to a close here. My point in going through this is not that nothing else matters. Globalization is a, is a factor. The fact that employers can turn to low-wage workers elsewhere, that's relevant. But the way globalization is structured is a political issue. Don't believe the stories about technology. They say, you know, if you get a good education, and you become technologically capable, you'll, you'll do fine. The people in that 1% aren't getting there because they know how to write computer programs, believe me. Uh, that is not, a, those are not the people that have, I mean, I'm sure some of them do, but that's not what gets them there. Now, the point I'm trying to make is that political decisions had a lot to do with this rising inequality, and that means that political decisions can go in the other direction. Political actions can take place that would move things in the other direction. There are campaigns going on that I mentioned here in Massachusetts. There's the Raise Up Massachusetts campaign, which is focused on two things. One is this campaign to raise the minimum wage. The other is to require employers to provide sick leave. Now, sick leave is a terribly, terribly important for people's well-being, to go back to what I, uh, what I said at the beginning about health care. 
so those, those are a couple of examples. There are also the political environment in which unions operate. It makes a difference whether you have people in the National Labor Relations Board who will enforce the laws or people who will ignore the laws. So that's a political issue, a way to, to, that things can be, uh, can be dealt with as well. There are a number of other things. One of the things I uh, think is important to end up where I, back where I started with health care, is that the improvements in the way we organize our health care system. We have this new system that is referred to as Obamacare, uh, which has some positive elements to it. Uh, many of you, for example, uh, if your parents have health insurance, can stay on until you're 26. You couldn't do that before. You, could, you can't be refused for pre-existing conditions and so on. But Obamacare still involves the private insurance companies making a huge amount of money off our health care. Medicare, however, is a system, it's a government system. We, you know, we, people who object to the government being involved don't seem to object much about Medicare. It works very well. It costs less than private insurance. Private insurance profits and overhead account for about four times as much as they do in, uh, in, in Medicare. Uh, we need to move toward a system which is sometimes called Medicare for all. It would have tremendous advantages, not only in terms of the health care system, but in terms of the power of workers in their relation with their employers. A lot of people I know say, I can't leave my job, because if I leave my job, I lose my health care. Well, with Medicare for all, people can lose their, leave their job, look for a better employer, they can demand higher wages, they're in a better position. It means that all, all of us are taking responsibility for all of us. It has a, a factor that increases social solidarity. It provides security for people. And in security, there is power. So you can tell the whole story from beginning to end in terms of health care as well as in terms of income. Now let me stop there, and I think you, you want to say something about Okay, well, let, we have some more to say about the campaigns going on here with regard to Raise Up Massachusetts, but let me see if you have questions, comments, objections, whatever you'd like to say. Yeah. What is the major reason for the, uh, the shutdown now? The government shut down now. Right. Well, <laughs> that, as I understand it, the simple explanation is that the... Republicans in Congress have followed a practice where they will do things determined by the majority of Republicans in Congress. The majority of Republicans in Congress have decided that they can't win on passing laws that they would like, so, but they can have the Congress, the House of Representatives, not pass certain things which are essential to the operation of the government. So a minority in the House of Representatives is able to hold up the bills which would allow the government to continue operating unless they get certain concessions from not only the majority in Congress but the President as well. I, that this is a great cost to us. I, Time Magazine this week apparently has a cover that says majority rule X'd out because we have a minority in Congress that is calling the shots. Uh, now, what's not clear to me, you see, the Republicans who disagree with this, uh, the, the majority of their group will not confront them. Uh, and we are stuck in this situation. The problem with the government shutdown is severe on many people, and as long, longer it lasts, will have severe impacts. Uh, however, I, the general view is that if next week they refuse to raise the debt limit, which would allow the government to pay for things that Congress has already approved, then the implications will be much worse. Because what that will mean was, is that the first time in history 
the United States government will default on its debts. Uh, now, if you default on your debts, how, how do you think you're going to do next time you go to the bank and ask for a loan? Well, you might not get it, but if you get it, what's going to happen? You're going to have to pay a lot more for it. Moreover, it is going to throw the whole international financial situation into untested waters. And that's going to could lead to a tremendous disruption of not only the US economy, but because the US economy and the dollar is so central to the operation of the international economy, uh, it could affect other countries as well. Yet that's what they're saying they will do. Now, you, you know, there, you, you could say, well, why doesn't the president and the majority of Congress just give in? Well, I, I think that the issue here is the argument is that if you give in on this, what's next? I mean, this, this may be not worth a good thing to give in on, but even if you thought this was you know, reasonable, um, once, you, once you give it, now, you know, the government, the president said, I'll be glad to negotiate, but not until we solve this problem. Other questions? I mean, it's very much tied up to the distribution of income and the power of the top 1% because this was planned with, with groups, individuals who come from this very rich part of the society working with Congress since the time Obama was reelected. They realized they could not get what they wanted by the standard procedures in Congress and they had meetings where they worked out the strategy that they are now undertaking. So it is directly connected to the power of the very wealthy that I've been talking about. Yes? You had mentioned that um, in other countries, it's much, other countries, workers are much more mobile. They can move up quicker than here. Why is that? I wouldn't say much more mobile. I'd say that, I, that there are a number of reasons. One is, for example, that the educational systems are much less expensive in most other countries, creating uh, that avenue for people to move up. Uh, secondly is, because they are less unequal, the distance to move is not as great. Uh, there are a number of other barriers. Uh, one of the big issues in this country, which isn't the same in most of the other countries I'm comparing with, is the racial division uh, that exists here as well which creates barriers and barriers of expectation. I, you know, if you just, you know, if you, if you, you know, we're, we talk about a post-racial society. Well, uh, a friend of mine came from England yesterday to, to visit. And when I picked him up at the airport, uh, you know, there, there were four big jets coming in from Europe at the same time. There were, you know, hundreds of people coming through customs. I, so it took him about an hour. He said, he said it was very efficient. He said, but, in this whole room, one person was being held up by customs. He said, what do you think the trait that defined that person was? Well, I didn't have to guess very far. It was a person of color that, uh, that got stopped. I, and uh, you know, there may have been some other reason. There always could be another reason. But uh, with hundreds of people there, that was the one person that got stopped. So that's another factor that is, that's a little different here than it is in many others. Other questions or comments that uh, would you just as a gift, so, see if anybody else has. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me go back just a minute to this other question. One of the other differences between the United States and most of the other countries uh, at a similar income level is they have different health care systems. We spend twice as much on health care as virtually any other country as a percent of our income. Um, you say we spend more because we're richer. We spend a higher percent of our income. There's no evidence that we have a better health care system. Uh, we certainly don't have longer life expectancy than other countries. Uh, and for things I mentioned about health care affecting security uh, and so on, that's another factor that relates to, uh, to mobility. I, but now let me, well, tell me your question again. I'm sorry. I, what if the healthcare is an issue for the 
Well, it, it, it's a good question why, why uh, health care is, is such, such a big issue. I, that I think that part of the issue is that the, when it was instituted, the new program, I, the, it was, and earlier when there were attempts, they were fought very hard by the insurance companies. And the insurance companies, in fact, got a, a pretty good deal uh, on this one because everybody's forced to buy insurance from them. Uh, but the, the thing that bothered people a lot was the individual mandate. That is, you have to have insurance. And if you don't have insurance, you have to pay, I think, $2,000. Uh, now, people viewed this I, as uh, offensive, I, and uh, that this contributed along with the campaigns against it to unpopularity. So I think the Republicans view this as an issue on which they can gain political support uh, by, by opposing it. Now, the trouble is, they're, in my view, they're misreading the polls. The polls say that a majority of people do not like Obamacare. And therefore, they say, see, that's what we say. Why don't they listen to the American people? Well, the, prob <coughs> the problem is that about a third of that majority that doesn't like Obamacare are people like me. I don't like Obamacare because I think we could have a lot better system. We could have a lot better system, Medicare for all, or what's called a single payer system. And that, you know, if, we, if Obamacare is, is the best we could get, okay, it's an improvement over what we had before. I think a lot of people think that. So I don't think it's popular as Republicans. Also, I, I think that a lot of the very rich view it as something that involves them paying for other people's health. Wealthy people have increasingly taken the position, for example, we don't want to pay. We want lower taxes. We don't want to pay for schools for other people's children. We don't view schools as a social obligation. Even though we want the schools to train people that we can employ. employ. We want, there's a big thing in, in Massachusetts and elsewhere, to have more STEM workers. STEM workers, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. STEM. It turns out there really isn't a shortage of STEM workers in the country. So why do they want more STEM workers? Well, if you have more STEM workers, you know about supply and demand. It means that wages won't be pushed up. It means wages will stay down. Now, there's a power issue here. Health care, security, and power go together. So the old system we had was more in the liking of people at the top for those kind of reasons. So I think for that, the political reasons I mentioned and, and so on, and these practical power region, reasons are factors in their attack on Obamacare. Dan. Yeah, I just wanted to mention um, before, because I know people are going to be leaving soon, um, these issues of increasing economic inequality and increasing poverty are things we can do something about, as our speaker indicated. And there's a campaign that he referred to called the Raise Up Massachusetts campaign, which is to increase the minimum wage and also to provide earned sick time or paid sick days to, to most workers. And this campaign is right now in the stage of collecting petitions to be able to qualify these questions to the ballot. So these laws, the minimum wage law and the earned sick time law, would actually appear on the ballot in 2014 and people would have a chance to vote. This is something that you could contribute to if these issues matter to you. And I'm willing to bet that more than half the people in this room work at jobs or have worked at jobs that are below, which are minimum wage below 250, 1050, which is what we're trying to get the minimum wage to. And I'm willing to bet that many of you have worked at jobs or are working at jobs where there's no paid sick days. And so if you would like to help out with this campaign, there is a lot of things you can do. There's a lot of students at BCC already who are circulating petitions. You can bring it to your friends, to your neighbors, to your co-workers, to your family. But also you can go out to supermarkets to use soccer games in places in the community. 
And many of the teachers are also providing opportunities to serve as learning for this, which involves 10 hours a week doing this work. And there's a bunch of people that are getting service learning credit. So I wanted to see if anybody here is interested in that. And I'm going to be down here collecting evaluation points when you leave. But also, if you're interested possibly in volunteering for this campaign, we're doing service learning for it. Uh, I'll take your information down and get back. we'll get back in touch with you. So I really encourage people to get involved, because that's ultimately the only way that we can make a change, as you said, is to change the politics, to change what the government is doing. And by pushing on a grassroots level, we can equalize the playing field. Because big business obviously has the money and the threats to cause jobs and so on and so forth. But people power is real too. And the more people power we have, the more we can counter this and make a difference. So again, I encourage you to get involved and make, to do that. So I'll be down here if you want to share your name with me uh, and help out. And we distribute the... Yeah. They got the evaluation forms. Hmm? Evaluation forms? Yeah. They yeah. have it. Yeah. They have it in their hand. Oh, okay. I didn't know they had Any other questions before or comments before we close down for the morning? Yeah. I mean, based on the, your argument about politics, why are Americans uh, as passive as they are, or appear to be, in terms of changing the, the, uh, the political structure? Uh, the role of media, or what, you know, what's Well, going there, are a lot of, there are a lot of factors. I mean, one is that we have a, a history and a rhetoric that says how we are better off in this country, and we're exceptional, uh, and so on. Uh, and we look at some other parts of the world, and we see that that's true, that we are much better off. Uh, and I think that has contributed a lot to people uh, uh, accepting things. However, that's becoming less and less true. Uh, it's, I mean, of course, there are parts of the world that are extremely poor, and that we are much better off than. You know, it's, you know, it's, that there's no denying that. But as I indicated. Uh, in terms of our, our living conditions, in terms of our health care in particular, we are not so well off. By lots of measures of, of uh, healthy living, not just medical issues, we're not so much better off. Uh, but by other, some of the other things I mentioned, our crime rate, our incarceration rate, uh, I think that these things will eventually make a difference. But I think that to a large extent, the rhetoric of the past the way things are presented in the media uh, are, uh, are not, not, not insignificant in affecting. I'll just tell you if, you, if you say, if you have this feeling that we can't ever win against big money, uh, in fact, in the last couple of months, there have been two issues on which the government has been forced to switch course. These are not the be-all and end-all issues, but they deserve to be noticed. One of these was not particularly or directly related to the economy. That is, it was quite clear that President Obama and the government in general were ready to uh, take military action against Syria. Now, whatever you think of that, you should recognize that a large part of the reason it was not undertaken was there was a massive public opposition to it. An active pu public opposition and a polled opposition that really shifted things so that once the government saw an out in this, uh, this proposal that was, uh, that was brokered by the Russians, they jumped at it because the, the popular position had been so loudly expressed. The other was directly related to the economy. It was quite clear that the government, the President Obama, was ready to appoint a man named Larry Summers as the head of the Federal Reserve uh, a very important, probably the most important economic uh, position. Uh, he was the per a person who was very much responsible for the deregulation of banking in the 1990s that led us into the crisis. He has very close connections, gets millions of dollars in consulting fees from the big banks. There was an outpouring of popular opposition, and he was forced out of the picture. Now, these are little things in the greater scheme of inequality, but they are examples of, you know, there are times that we can win things, uh, and they deserve to be noted. They didn't just happen. They were a result of popular opposition. And that if you look at their support, for example, uh, for raising the minimum wage, for 
uh, th it's there. Uh, and if it's brought out, it makes a difference. So thank you very much.